60 years ago in Tel Aviv, David Ben-Gurion proclaimed Israel's independence, founded on the natural right of the Jewish people to be masters of their own fate. What followed was more than the establishment of a new country. It was the redemption of an ancient promise given to Abraham and Moses and David, a homeland for the chosen people, Eretz Israel. Sunday morning at St. Andrews, we sang one of my favorite hymns, And Can It Be, and by Charles Wesley. I love the hymn, except I have to edit it. I t try to tell my congregation when we get to the refrain, that thou, my God, shouldst die for me, Charles Wesley, shame on you. God died? On the cross? Are you crazy? <laughs> Charles Wesley, shame on you! Are you crazy? The hill outside of Jerusalem would have been vaporized. Jerusalem would have vanished along with the whole rest of creation. Because apart from the being of God, nothing can exist for a split second. God didn't die. The God-man died. The God who took upon Himself a human nature died touching His humanity. But the deity didn't perish on the cross. It may sound great in our hymns, but it's a ghastly thought. Good evening, good morning, wherever you are in this world. Welcome back to the Theological Conference 2024, the night session, the nightcap. And to cap it off, we have none other than Anthony Buzzard. So he'll start uh, in a few minutes. As you can see there, today's schedule, a long one, starting at 10 a.m., Matt Sacra, followed by Barbara, then Ken and Tracy. And yesterday or last night, Robin, Todd, and Dan Gill. And once again, thanks to all our speakers. As many of you can appreciate, a lot of work goes into these sessions. So we hope uh, you have enjoyed them find them edifying, <clears throat> and all the recordings, live streams, automatically uploaded on our YouTube channel, and when I get the chance, I will upload the, the uh, separate or specific presentation standalone. So thanks to everyone, and prayers for our speakers, some of whom are going through 
health issues as most of us do in this present evil age. So we appreciate your prayers for all of them. And uh, let's see, so before we begin, we had a free drawing and uh, for an item, to win an item from the kogmissions.com store, as you can see here. So they sell shirts and cups and stationaries and pillows. So I was asking everyone since we started last night to send their emails. So we got lots of feedback and here's the wheel of fortune <laughs> or the raffle wheel, if you want to call it, or the drawing wheel. Okay, so we have the initials there of people who I got their emails before 7 p.m. Eastern Standard or New York time right now. So we're going to do this thing. We're going to spin it. And whoever wins, I will contact you. So Godspeed, everyone, and see where this lands. J.H. Okay, let me note that down. J.H. Congratulations. So I'll be contacting you uh, to once again pick an item from the KOG Mission store. But guess what? We're going to give someone else a chance because we're all about second chances, right? <laughs> so we're going to spin this again and give someone else a chance to win. So here we go. Looks like NJ. Congratulations, NJ. So I'll be contacting you to pick a, your free item from the KLG Missions store. But guess what? We're about third chances. So we're going to do one last one. So for anyone out there who thinks we're a bit unfair, <laughs> so you'll get another shot at it. So let's spin this again. And the last time to give you a third chance to win. And looks like SB. All righty. SB. Congratulations and thanks to everyone who entered and those tuning in live. So once again, uh, from the KOG Mission store, so I'll email you with the link to the store. And if you're uh, if you're um, picking a uh, clothes shirt or a hoodie or something, uh, I'll I'll ask you obviously the size and so on and what type and just make sure you get the color you want or the scripture or the writing, etc. So yeah, just let me know and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it on email. Okay, doke. so let's now uh, business at hand. So this man needs uh, really no introduction, but I'll Try my best. Anthony Buzzard, born in Surrey, England, educated Oxford University, Bethany Theological Seminary, served as co editor of a journal from the Radical Reformation, the current editor in chief of Focus on the Kingdom, a free monthly magazine, which, by the way, the April 2024 edition is online. Just go to our focusonthekingdom.org main page. Anthony is married to Barbara and lives in Fayetteville, Georgia. And uh, if you'd like to know more about Anthony, he has a long, long distinguished career. He even has, look at that, his own uh, Wikipedia page. If you'd like to get the nitty gritty, the 
the true story of Sir Anthony Buzzard. Uh, you can uh, read his bio there, <clears throat> rather extensive. So, okay, and this evening, Anthony will read from his paper. I posted the link in, actually, let me do that now because I think I posted a link that did not work. So as you can see the title there, the gospel and the second Adam recovering our future inheritance. Good evening, Anthony. Good evening, Carlos. Thank you for all of that good introduction. Very moving material you played for us. Thankful for that. Thank you. All right. So it's all yours. Yeah, the gospel and the second Adam recovering our future inheritance. I want to make a point to you here that it does matter what you believe about the future because that's to do with believing the gospel. Paul is infuriated, I'm not exaggerating there, that his church members would be confused about the kingdom of God and when the kingdom will be and what it will mean. An understanding of God's kingdom gospel timetable was an essential part of grasping the Christian faith. Today, issues about the millennium and so-called amillennialism, which means no millennium, are presented to the public as though they're complicated. Paul, I think, would be horrified by such arguments, especially when the answers to such so-called problems are presented as difficult. They're not difficult for those who are in tune with the Hebrew Jesus. So let me start with Paul's horror at so-called amillennialism. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 8 brings out the sharpest irony from Paul. He says this. Some of you have become rich already. Some of you think you're kings already. I wish indeed that you were already kings so that we would be reigning as kings with you. These words are amazingly revealing of Paul's thinking and Jesus' thinking. They're no less instructive for us today. So some history, along with some Bible verses. It was Calvin, I hope you know this, who was no lover of the saving gospel of the kingdom. When Jesus' own expertly instructed students asked the right question about if the time had now arrived for the kingdom to be restored to Israel, we found that in Acts 1.6, Calvin showed how blind he was to the gospel by saying, and I quote Calvin's words, there are as many errors as there are words in that question. Calvin did not understand the gospel of the kingdom. The lesson for us today is the where of Calvinism, it can mislead you. The question in Acts 1.6 meant, has the time now finally come for the kingdom of God to be restored to Israel? Jesus had likewise said, look up, because the time of your redemption is drawing near, Luke 21, 28. The time meant, of course, was the time when the whole world would come under the supervision of the Messiah Jesus, assisted by his saints. Is that important? Could anything be more important? Acts 3, 21 explained that Jesus must be retained in heaven until the future time comes for the restoration of all things about which the whole Bible had spoken. Now, the public today generally does not know what the kingdom of God is, and so it does not know what the gospel is. It needs to know what the prophets of the Hebrew Bible had in mind, as in Luke 1.32, the Lord God will give to Jesus the throne of his father David. That was perfectly clear to them, but today it's not. So the public needs the same instruction. The public has been told that the gospel is only about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins so that we can, so to speak, get off the hook and be forgiven. But that is only a half gospel. The missing dimension of that gospel today is that no mention is made of the kingdom of God, 
in Greek, the Vasilia to Theou, I'm using the modern Greek pronunciation, which we did at the college when I taught Greek there. What people do not know until you tell them, and I mean you, the audience here, is that the destiny of man from Genesis on was that they were to inherit and possess the whole world because the gracious God created the world for them and he wanted to give it to them. Jesus knew that he was the Messiah destined to be the heir of the world and to rule that world for God as God's image or representative. So Jesus' mission was to recruit others now to be kings and priests and to rule the world to succeed where Adam failed. I discovered this verse oh, a year or so ago now. I'm not ever forgotten the day when I discovered it. Jeremiah 27, 5. Listen to this now from God. By my great strength and outstretched arm, I, God, made the earth and the people and the animals on the face of the earth. And I give it to anyone who pleases me. See also Daniel 4, 17. Is that good news? What a generous God. The idea is repeated by Jesus, please note, in Luke 12, 32. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your father is delighted to give you the kingdom. The gospel then is about regaining our lost inheritance of the whole world. That inheritance was given to us all, potentially, by God at creation. It was given to Adam, but he failed. Paul is clear about the gospel and your and my future and destiny. Jesus chose the concept kingdom of God, Vasilia to Theou in Greek, Malchut Hashamayim in Hebrew, to summarize his determination to reverse what Adam was had ruined, what Adam had ruined. So fact one to be grasped in the future millennium. The devil will not be able to deceive the world a moment longer. So where's the devil located now? According to Revelation 20, verses 2 to 3, the devil during the future millennium is going to be banished from this world to the abyss. There, removed from the earth, he's going to be under lock and key, and I quote now, so that he cannot, from the beginning of that yet future millennium, deceive the nations any longer. So my point to you is this, it would be a disastrous illusion to think that the devil has already become no threat to any of us. So now let's talk about justification. A heavy word used a lot, not really difficult though when we describe what it is. We need to think hard about how we are to become right with God, justified. How can we be right with God as opposed to wrong with God? A very popular view is that the forgiveness achieved for us on the cross is the whole story, but it's not. Let us see that justification is a term applicable to something more than the discharge of an accused person uncondemned. This from the pulpit commentary. I quote, we must not restrict justification to deliverance from deserved penalty, but we must attach to it the further idea of inheritance. As one writer has well remarked, justification, being right with God, is a term applicable to something more than the discharge of an accused person without condemnation. As in our courts of law, there are civil as well as criminal cases. And so it was in old time, and a large number of the passages adduced seem to refer to trials of the former or the civil description, in which some question of, get this, property, right, or inheritance was under discussion between the two parties. The judge, by justifying one of the parties, decided that the property in question was to be regarded as his. Applying this aspect of the matter, this aspect of the matter, 
to the justification of man in the sight of God, we gather from Scripture that while through sin man has forfeited his legal claim to any right or inheritance which God might have to bestow on his creatures, so through justification man is restored to his high position and regarded as an heir of God. I find that a very profound statement from the pulpit commentary. So God wants to give Jesus and us the world as our inheritance and possession. The first command to Jesus, sorry, the first command of Jesus to us is as follows. Repent and believe in your potential to possess the kingdom of God. That's the gospel where you always start. Do not begin with Romans. Begin with Jesus in Mark 1, verses 1, 14 and 15. This is what Mark calls the beginning of the gospel. Isn't that a good place to start? That's where, according to Jesus, the gospel starts. Is that not exactly what Hebrews 2 3 says, which we also discovered this year very vividly. Hebrews 2 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which had its beginning and foundation in the teachings and words of Jesus? What is man, says the book of Hebrews, what is man that you're mindful of him, that you care about him? You made man a little bit lower than the angels, but you crowned him with honor and glory. This is a royal book and a royal promise. But then the book of Hebrews says rightly, of course, most importantly, we do not yet, not yet do we see everything subjected to man. So the timetable is all important. So defining the gospel, what is the gospel about the coming kingdom? I read from Isaiah and Micah. Now it will come about in that last days, in the last days, that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains, and it will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, let's go up to the house of the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, so that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For instruction will go out from Zion, Jerusalem, and the message of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will settle disputes among the nations, disputes between the nations, and he will judge disputes for many peoples. And then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against other nation, and never again will they learn war. It's good for your brain to hear those words. Enjoy that marvelous prophecy. So in the days of those kings, we read, represented by Daniel's image, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. That kingdom will not be left to another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it, the kingdom of God, will itself endure forever. Daniel 2.44. Listen, my good friends, fellows in the gospel of the kingdom, if you're not defining the kingdom from Daniel, you're not getting off on the right foot at all. Daniel 2.44. Jesus loved the book of Daniel, and so should you. Now, another quote. He, the Messiah, will be great. And he'll be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, 2 Samuel 7, and he will be king over the house of Jacob forever. Luke 1 32 to 33. These are very encouraging, they're very inspiring, awe, filled with awe. And you should marvel at them. As I said before, it's good for your brain to take hold of this marvelous hope. What I just gave you there is the Bible gospel, the good news of salvation, which is so absent 
from current gospels of so-called sin management. The current gospel is, well, God has forgiven you because Jesus died for you. That's not wrong. But it's only half the story. He's forgiven you so that you can recover the inheritance which you threw away as Adam first did. Yes, it's great to be forgiven. But forgiven for what? So that you can inherit the world, which is God's gift to those he chooses to give it to, provided, of course, we choose to believe in the message. The author of a series of explanatory sermons on essential Christianity asked in 1894, and I'm asking now the same question in 2024, have you already pondered the fact that Jesus Christ was always preaching the kingdom of God? Have you thought about that? And that in the model prayer which he gave us, he taught us to pray always that his kingdom might come, not kingdom spread, but come. Matthew 6.10. In the present day, men are always talking about the church. In view of this modern practice, is it not startling to be reminded that in the model prayer, there's no reference to the church, while the reference to the kingdom is prominent and pronounced? So far as the record goes, Christ referred to the church only twice. On the other hand, he speaks of the kingdom not less than 112 times. The same author went on to point out that one of the most mischievous and fatal mistakes ever made in Christian history was the mistake of a St. Augustine who identified the kingdom of God with the church. But the church is no more the kingdom of God than the British army is the British Empire. It's high time, said this writer, for all Christians to ponder the long lost teaching of Christ with respect to the kingdom. I want to repeat that. It's long beyond time that we get the kingdom of God as the right definition for the gospel. So it's been our contention that a loss of clarity regarding the kingdom of God must directly affect our comprehension of Jesus' saving gospel message, the Christian gospel. The kingdom of God is, as we've seen, the principal subject of all that Jesus taught. And Luke 4.43, I don't need, I hope to tell you what that is. That's Jesus' purpose statement. I must preach the gospel of the kingdom. That's why God sent me. I hope that's clear. There can therefore be no question of our respect or responding. You can't respond to Jesus' call for repentance and belief in the gospel message about the kingdom. Mark 1 if you don't know what he meant by the kingdom of God. Any appeal for us to accept the gospel when no reference to or explanation of the kingdom of God appears must automatically be defective since it omits an essential and foundational part of the saving message offered and commanded now, note the strong word, commanded by Jesus. You don't have an option. You are to believe in the gospel of the kingdom, Jesus said, as preached by Jesus and the apostles for repentance and belief. And you can look up those verses. The kingdom of God is everything in the gospel, according to Jesus in the New Testament. If perhaps we vaguely imagined the kingdom to be a synonym for the church, the community of the faithful, we will have to examine the biblical evidence to see if the kingdom can possibly be confined to a reign of God in the present time, either in your heart or in the body of believers as a whole. If we've been talking about heaven as the goal of the Christian faith, we'll have to repent and begin to speak instead of, as Jesus always did, of the coming kingdom of God on the future earth, which begins with the millennium. So the author we cited by went on to tell us about the roots of Jesus' conception of the kingdom. I think, he said, there can be no doubt where Jesus Christ found and nourished his doctrine of the kingdom. He found it in the book of Daniel, and especially in D Daniel 7. Let me remind you that Daniel 7 is actually in Aramaic rather than Hebrew. It's so special that God inspired it in the Aramaic language, which was widespread, and it would have been the language in which Mary called Jesus into lunch, Aramaic. Seventh 
chapter of Daniel is special because it's written in the Aramaic language. There are many evidences that the book of Daniel is one of the very favorite books of Jesus Christ, one of the books which he diligently and deeply studied during the years of his peaceful obscurity in Nazareth before his stormy public ministry began. Jesus makes several references to Daniel. And when the book of Daniel is once understood, it throws a flood of light upon the numerous parables in which our Lord described the kingdom. Jesus declared again and again that the kingdom was the first object of his life to proclaim. And he asserted it ought to be the first object of our lives to promote. He summed up all our duties in the ever memorable command to seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. So taking our cue from the book of Daniel, we may easily establish the fact that the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven, which are exactly the same synonyms, no difference, is a real external empire. Not only this, it's to be an empire which will seize power suddenly and dramatically from the world's governments, which preceded, and it will be administered by the Son of Man, as Jesus himself, Daniel 7, 13 to 14, and please get this, also administered by the saints, Daniel 7, 27, and that verse should be translated correctly, that all nations are going to serve and obey the saints, not just serve and obey God. We know that. But this is stupendously impressive language. All the nations will serve and obey them, the saints. Daniel 7, 27. On no account from the evidence of Daniel could it be an invisible reign established only in the hearts of believers. On no account, I add here, could it be a personal millennium, each person having his own personal millennium. That's just sheer chaos and confusion. Its political dimension, as well as its location on earth, is unmistakably clear. It's equally obvious that the kingdom of God, described by Daniel, preached as gospel by Jesus, has not yet appeared. So we read this, and in the days of these kings, in the book of Daniel, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom. In the New Testament, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, doesn't matter which, they are alternative synonymous phrases. It will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these other kingdoms but it will itself endure forever, Daniel 2.44. So in your personal evangelism that you're working with your friends and others at every opportunity, you begin by defining the kingdom in the book of Daniel. In the next verse, the impact of the kingdom is likened to a stone crushing the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold of former world empires. The certainty of the shattering event is based on, and I quote, what the great God has made known to the king and what will take place in the future. You are now equipped with that information and your responsibility is to add this information to the understanding of every friend and contact you may come across. The dream is true. The interpretation is trustworthy, not impossibly difficult. Then here it is. The sovereignty, the dominion, the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Their kingdom, mistranslated as God's kingdom, but their kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions will serve and obey them. Daniel 7, 27. Some of the translations get that right. They were embarrassed by that. Some translations, they didn't like the idea of us being in charge of the kingdom with Jesus. So they fudged the Hebrew there or the Aramaic, but that's the correct translation. The kingdom of God is evidently, evidently an empire exercising sway over all nations. It will come to power on the earth under the whole heaven and its establishment will be by a catastrophe, an international upheaval 
resulting in a complete political reorganization. The administration of the kingdom will be in the hands of the Son of Man and the saints, the holy people of all the ages, the true believers. A recurring theme of the New Testament, but this is infrequently preached, is that Jesus and his followers will be the executives of the new world government, the kingdom of God. And you could look at those verses. Please do, as you have leisure to do it, Matthew 19, 28. This is the whole hope of Christianity. And it means that you are a king or queen in training. Nothing whatsoever to do with going to heaven when you die, which is absolutely false and misleading. So Jesus' announcement of a coming crisis, in the light of this background information, Jesus' public proclamation of the nearness of the kingdom must be understood as a warning about a great future crisis in history. This stupendous event foreseen not only by Daniel, but by all the other Hebrew prophets demanded an immediate repentance and reform, a reformation of lifestyle. The point of the call for repentance because the kingdom of God is at hand. Those are the words of Jesus in the beginning of the gospel, Mark 1, verses 1, 14 to 15, was simply that a place as an executive with Jesus in that kingdom would be granted only to those found living in faithful obedience to God. The threatening element in the proclamation of the gospel can be seen from John the Baptist's appeal for a U-turn in conduct private and national, because the kingdom of God was at hand. Matthew 3, verse 2, referring to Jesus, John says, his winnowing tool image from farming here is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. He, the Messiah, will gather his wheat into the barn, and he'll burn up the chaff with fire, which cannot be put out. Matthew 3.12. Matthew describes this message in exactly the same words as he summarizes the teaching of Jesus. Both agents of God's gospel word, John and Jesus, called for repentance. Matthew 3.2.4.17. The message contained both a threat and a promise. Sudden death as the appalling consequence of persistent unrepentance and the glory of of the future kingdom, beginning with the millennial kingdom in the future, for those who had heeded the message and prepared themselves accordingly. This simple theme governs the entire New Testament, indeed the entire Bible. There are two possible destinies for human beings, the barn or the bonfire. Either one enters the kingdom of Jesus' future return, or one is destroyed and not granted the possession of the kingdom, hence the critical warning element in the Christian gospel. Underlying the call for repentance was the well-known concept of the day of the Lord, predicted by all the Old Testament prophets. This day of terrible divine wrath is equated in the New Testament with the second coming of Jesus, the parousia, that's the Greek word for the second coming, to establish the promised kingdom. Thus, in the well-known parable of the tares, the good seed represents the children, the disciples of the kingdom, and the tares are the children of the evil one, the devil. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels, just as the tares are gathered up and burned up. So it will be at the end of the age. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, listen. It's crucial to note that the coming of the kingdom of God, in which the righteous are to shine like the sun, is placed at the future end of the age. At the same time as the appearance of the kingdom, the wicked will be cast into the furnace of fire. The kingdom of their father, that's to say the kingdom of God, in which the righteous appear in glory, is evidently a coming new world order introduced by a judgment of which the wicked perish. The kingdom in these texts is certainly not a kingdom of the present time, much less 
Is it a rule of God in your heart which collapses the entire gospel that destroys it? That kingdom has yet to appear at the end of the age. All of this fits admirably with the kingdom described in Daniel 2 and 7. And it's evident that Jesus derived all of this gospel, saving gospel teaching from that book. So these simple facts are confirmed by the context in Daniel from which Jesus referenced to the shining forth of the righteous is found. The words are part of Daniel's prediction of the resurrection of the dead, Daniel 12, 2 to 3. It's when many, I'm quoting now, of those who are sleeping, tells you what they're doing, in the dust of the ground, tells you where they're doing it, will awake to the life of the coming age, mistranslated as eternal life, which is too vague, the life of the coming age. It is then at that time that the righteous will, and I quote, will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven and like the stars. God has his Hollywood. Did you know that? The stars presented you on television are a very feeble and inadequate version of the real stars who are the royal family of the future kingdom. We know that the righteous, according to Jesus, Matthew 13, 43, are those who cause many to gain understanding. So how much is it worth to you to explain this to everybody else on earth? I would say that's very important as a priority because you're going to be a star in God's sight if you work at explaining this not only to yourself, but to your friends. It is by, look at this quote here, by his knowledge, not just his death on the cross, that my servant, Jesus, makes many righteous. Yes, you've got to be right, justified, and you've got to listen to the teaching of Jesus. These are the most important texts describing the Christian life. Now, let me share a few passages which will show you that the system out there which your friends are probably getting a dose of in church, is terribly misleading. Commentators often display their dislike of Jesus the Christ when they're confronted with the Savior's messianic outlook. We can most easily illustrate this for you, this antipathy to the messianic kingdom and thus to the gospel of the kingdom by citing a school of thought which denies Get this, that the book of Revelation derives its inspiration from Jesus Christ. What? There are men getting degrees in universities and filling the pulpits who have been told that the book of Revelation is a great mistake. Unfortunately, those who belong to the school of thought begin by misunderstanding Jesus and the message of the kingdom. They then accuse Jesus, particularly in the book of Revelation, of contradicting their misconception. It appears that unbelief carries it with it an inevitable penalty. Here it is in scriptural terms. If you will not believe, neither will you understand. Isaiah 7, 9. It's possible to be given over, and each of us has to look at himself, herself, and say, where am I in this scheme? It's possible to be given over to the power of our own sin and our own confusion. So we cite evidence of the fact that Jesus' message in the book of Revelation, and thus his whole messianic outlook, has been rejected by many. Quote, one book requires notice by reason of its peculiar character and its influence on Christian eschatology, teaching about the future, namely the revelation of John. Most, this is a critical view of the book of Revelation, which is terribly dangerous and causes utmost confusion. This writer said, most of the visions in the book of Revelation are so little, that is, have so little that is specifically Christian. Although I know they were given by Jesus Christ, but they're not Christian. Your friends in other churches are getting this from the pulpit and you have to try to correct it. This man goes on to say that the book of Revelation, we should question it, whether these things in the book of Revelation are just from Jewish, uh-oh, anti-Semitism, from Jewish sources. You bet they're from Jewish sources, but that doesn't make them wrong. 
but this critic was saying there's only a superficial adaptation of Christian use. Whatever degree of literary originality may be allowed to the author of Revelation, the matter is Jewish throughout. You bet it is, and you'd better not be anti-Semitic and be muddled and confused about anything in the book of Revelation. The resurrection of the saints to enjoy the thousand-year reign, the millennium, the war of Gog and Magog, the end of the millennium, their destruction, the general resurrection, the last judgment, the new Jerusalem descending from heaven in all its glitter of gold, even to the river of life, and the trees bearing monthly crops of new fruits and medicinal leaves. This author said in a disastrous mistake that he will one day repent of, I hope, he says these are trite ideas and the imagery of Jewish eschatology. The system out there, and your friends are part of it. Sometimes even Unitarians are being deceived along these lines because everything in the book of Revelation are words of Jesus. And there's a very strong threat in the very last chapter of Revelation. If you don't believe what Jesus said, the plagues in the book are going to come on you. So I would avoid that. In the second century, millenarian eschatology, belief that the saints will rule with Messiah for a thousand years, was orthodoxy. Of course, everybody knew it in Asia Minor and the wide regions which took their theology from that source. It's also the faith of Irenaeus. So if you are a pre-millennial person and fully convinced, understanding that, you're in a very good tradition, even in post-biblical times. So we may applaud this excellent summary, as I just quoted you from this man writing about the book of Revelation. We can applaud what he says about what the book of Revelation expects, while we marvel at the cavalier fashion in which these great truths of the New Testament are dismissed as non-Christian and Jesus' vision is dismissed as trite. That's the way to be lost. That's the way to lose out on salvation, as Matt Sacro was outlining for us so expertly this morning. It's a little known fact that the founding fathers of large sections of Protestant Christianity also found the message of Jesus recorded in the Revelation unacceptable. Oh, yes, they did. And some Unitarian people are creeping in that dangerous direction currently. So, note this, you didn't know this. Luther, at first, in his preface to the translation of the New Testament, expressed a strong aversion. Can you believe this? Express a strong aversion to the book of Revelation, declaring that to him it had every mark of being neither prophetic nor apostolic. Many of your friends are Lutherans. Show them that horrifying idea of Luther. He cannot, that's Luther, cannot see that it was the work of the Holy Spirit. Moreover, he does not like the commands and threats which the writer makes about this book at the end and the promise of blessedness to to those who keep what's written. That's what the book of Revelation says, and Luther did not like that. When, as Luther said wrongly, no one knows what that's talking about anyway, so how can we believe it? And there are many nobler books to be kept than the book of Revelation. This is Luther in his early days. Moreover, many fathers rejected the book. Finally, Luther said, horrifying. Finally, everyone thinks of it whatever his spirit imparts. My spirit, Luther speaking here in his early days, cannot adopt, adapt, I should say, to this book of Revelation. And a sufficient reason why I do not esteem it highly is that Christ is neither taught nor recognized in it, which is what an apostle ought before all things to do. So later, we will concede in 1534, Luther finds a possibility that maybe there's some usefulness in the book of Revelation. He still thought it was a hidden, dumb prophecy unless interpreted. And upon the interpretation, no certainty, nobody knew what it said anyway, this was Luther's point of view, no certainty had been reached after many efforts. He remained doubtful, Luther did, about its apostolicity 
And in 1545, get this now, printed, he printed the book with Hebrews and James and Jude as an appendix to his New Testament, not numbered in the index. And so a colleague, Zwingli, a leading reformer, also regarded Revelation as not a biblical book. And even Calvin, with his high view of inspiration, never wrote a commentary on 2nd and 3rd John or Revelation. So readers should reflect on these remarkable facts that churches have continued to give their allegiance to Calvin and Luther, despite the former's hesitancy about the Revelation and the latter's obvious refusal to heed the warnings of Jesus given in the book of Revelation and here they are. Listen to the words of Jesus to all of us. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy in this book of Revelation. If anyone takes away from the words of that book, God will take away that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which is described in this book, Revelation 22, 18 to 19. I don't recommend that you imagine our millennialism as a remote possibility since it contradicts absolutely the plain teaching about the future millennium in the book of Revelation. So that statement in Revelation 22 hardly sounds as if the book could be safely relegated to an appendix. The book of Revelation, as is well recognized, draws together the strands of Old Testament prophecy, describes the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth at the second coming of Jesus, it's the fitting, glorious climax to the expectations of both Old and New Testament, depicting the triumph of the kingdom of God over a hostile world, which I recommend you believe because it's the gospel. Okay, the kingdom of God announced by Jesus will finally come to power on earth when the seventh angel sounds his trumpet. The kingdom of this world, we read in Revelation, note that none of the present nations are the kingdom of God, including America. None of them has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. And he's going to reign to the ages of the ages. You've assumed power and have begun to reign, we read in the Psalms. The Lord has begun to reign. That's a prophecy of the future kingdom. The nations were angry. But your righteous fury has come. The time has come for the dead to be judged, resurrected and judged. The time has come to give to your servants, the prophets, their reward. We're talking here about what reward you get for all the efforts and work that you've put into salvation. Those who fear your name, both small and great. And the time has come. It will come, in fact, at the return of Jesus to destroy those who are destroying the earth. Your brain, again, loves this material. Feed on this great hope and do not imagine that you are having a private millennium. Do not imagine that the devil has been cast out of the earth into a subterranean area. If so, the devil will be no threat to you at all. And yet the Bible says, watch out for the devil because he's like a prowling lion trying to deceive you. This is the kingdom of God, which I'm describing here, announced in the gospel message. And the kingdom for which Christians are to pray, may your kingdom come. It's not widely recognized that in so praying, Christians anticipate the overthrow of human governments in order that peace and harmony may prevail across the globe. One fact is unmistakably clear in the New Testament. The kingdom of God will come only as a result of a divine intervention bringing to an end the present evil age. So finally, a future with no substance. Look at this. The following inquiry was addressed to a representative of the clergy in a Presbyterian magazine. The response illustrates the unwillingness of many to face the stark reality of Jesus' warnings about the future. Question, why are there so few sermons in our churches on the second coming? Is this part of our belief or not? Answer. Not all Christians think alike on matters of theology, but it would be hard for someone to feel at home in our tradition who did not understand God as the one who has come, who is present, 
Christ is risen and who is yet to come in whatever form the future winds up taking. Whatever form, you make it up as you think best. To literalize the second coming is to ruin both its beauty and its significance. To ignore it is to avoid what may be the most important of the gospel, of the gospel, most important part of the gospel we know about since the past and the present, relatively speaking, are brief, but tomorrow borders on the forever. An appropriate reaction to this answer appeared in a later issue of that magazine. I compliment the Reverend so and so for his elusive, vague, non answer, to which I'm sure was a serious question concerning the second coming of Jesus. If I understand his answer, he said, in effect, we don't all agree, but if you want to be comfortable in our fellowship, you'll need to agree that Jesus is coming again, but not really. That is a very pressing danger for Unitarian people as of now. If you actually believe in the second coming, this guy said, you'll ruin its beauty and its significance. But you can't ignore it because it's in the future. This approach to the New Testament doctrine about the future is... I skipped here. Here we are. Is typical then of much of what has gone under the name of Christian teaching over many centuries. It's been hard for many to detect the trick being played with words when an outright rejection of the biblical doctrine of the kingdom is veiled by impressive theological language. What much traditional theology has done to the second coming, and I should add also to the millennium, which is future should not be graced with the term spiritualized. It has, in fact, evaporated the return of Christ. The whole vision of the prophets and the whole gospel of the kingdom is in jeopardy if its dominant future element is removed. Finally, the future kingdom of the, go of the gospel. While Jesus' leading phrase, kingdom of God, remains unclear, gospel is obscured. Perhaps it's this uncertainty over the meaning of Jesus' proclamation about the kingdom this has caused evangelicals to drop all reference to the kingdom of God and their definition of the gospel. It's up to us, and I now am uh, addressing our audience here, do what you can to explain the kingdom and the millennium properly to your friends. Next paragraph. Now I declare to you, Paul said, brothers and sisters, the gospel which I preach to you, which you received, on which you stand firm, which you also are being saved, being saved, please notice, if you hold firmly to the message which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. I delivered to you as of first importance, literally among the first things, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, he was buried and raised, and he appeared to Peter and the twelve, whether then I or they, so we proclaimed. Finally here, an important key to understanding Paul's fine statement about his own gospel message is found in the little phrase, en protis, amongst things of primary importance. The point is that it was the resurrection of Jesus which some of the Corinthians were beginning to doubt the resurrection of Jesus was. And how do you say, then, Paul complained, that there's no resurrection of the dead. In response to this particular crisis of belief, Paul reminds his audience that the death and resurrection of Jesus are of absolutely fundamental significance, which of course they are. Without his death, without Jesus' death to gain forgiveness for all of us, without his return from death to life through resurrection, there can be no gospel. That's absolutely true. It's a dangerous mistake, however, to argue that this text from this text in 1 Corinthians, that the facts about Jesus' death and resurrection formed the whole message. They did not. Paul is careful to say that these central facts were preached among matters of first importance. This, however, is not the entire gospel. There were other things also of equal importance, and there are the texts in the book of Acts, which I hope you all have memorized, showing the kingdom of God gospel was continuously and forever preached to all the people, Jews and Gentiles. We recall that Jesus had proclaimed the kingdom long before he spoke of his death and resurrection, a fact which proves that the kingdom of God is not a synonym for the death and resurrection of Christ. Furthermore, it's evident that Paul was not here directly addressing the subject of the kingdom of God as a future event, 
He wasn't talking about that in that particular passage. The Corinthians had accepted that belief as part of the gospel. Thus, Paul is able to elaborate on the doctrine of the kingdom only a few years later, having just a few verses later, I should say. Having just mentioned the future coming of Jesus in verse 23, he speaks of the kingdom over which Jesus will preside at his coming. That kingdom, it should be carefully noted, is the kingdom into which flesh and blood cannot enter, for the perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. In order to enter that future kingdom, of which the millennium is the first stage, in order to enter that kingdom of God, Christians must be summoned from death at the last trumpet and be changed in the blink of an eye into immortal persons. So these verses confirm once again the fact that the kingdom of God comes into power at the second coming. The kingdom has the principal place in the New Testament gospel message in addition, of course, to the equally essential preaching of the death and resurrection of the Savior, but it's a serious mishandling of the Bible to place 1 Corinthians 15 in conflict with the massive evidence for the central importance of the kingdom of God. Finally, then, the gospel hope. The loss of the kingdom from the Christian gospel stems from the loss of the biblical view about the future, which forms so vital a part of original Christianity. In the New Testament hope, the second of the trio of Christian virtues, faith, hope, and love, Hope, that is, is directed towards the glorious messianic future. Hope may be defined as desire for future good accompanied by faith in its realization. Faith has regard equally to past, present, and future, while no doubt in scripture it refers mainly to the future, the future millennium in our case. Hope is directed only to the future, very important virtue. A clear hope was instilled in the mind of the believer when he heard the gospel message about the kingdom. We heard about your faith in Messiah Jesus and your love for all the saints. Because of the hope of the future millennial kingdom that is stored up for you in heaven, you heard about this hope in the word of the truth, that's the gospel, just as you learned from Epaphras. When you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, you believed it. And you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of the promise, which is a down payment on our future inheritance. A few verses later, Paul prays that you may know the hope in which he's called you, the riches of the glory of his inheritance of the saints. It's critically important for believers to know that they're invited to rule the world with Messiah on the earth in that first stage of the kingdom, which is the millennium, which lies in the future. In these verses, it becomes clear that the future hope is part of Paul's gospel. Apostolic evangelism went beyond the promise of the forgiveness of sins and faith in Jesus' death. It put before the convert correctly the promise of inheriting the kingdom of God at the return of Jesus. A gospel message, therefore, which is not pledged to the future fact of God's coming intervention to overthrow all human government and grant the kingdom to the church, is not the gospel of the New Testament. The hope which the Colossians learned when they heard the gospel is of such significance that Paul speaks of the faith and love which spring from the hope. So your hope must be defined correctly. It's because of the hope prepared for them in heaven, that's to say prepared in God's plan in heaven, waiting to be revealed in the future. It's because of that Colossians are to develop all of these good qualities faith and love in the spirit, we should note that their hope of inheriting the kingdom of God is stored up in heaven. That's typical of the Jewish faith, that all the good things of the future are already prepared in heaven for the faithful waiting for Jesus to come back. In the light of these facts, finally, the definition of evangelism needs modification as follows. To evangelize, this is our task corporately, is to spread the good news that God has planned as the goal of history to establish his kingdom on the earth when Jesus returns. That Jesus now offers forgiveness through faith in his message of the kingdom of God. For all those who believe the gospel message of the kingdom and obey him, Acts 5.32, God grants the promise of his spirit now as a down payment 
to empower them in the present life in preparation for that millennial kingdom in the future, for positions of rulership with Christ in the kingdom to be inaugurated at his return. Blessed indeed and holy. That's the only verse in scripture which actually combines those two ideas. Blessed indeed and holy are those who take part in the first resurrection, which introduces the millennium, and who will reorder the world. What about this? As a parting thought, all of you then are in training to reorder the world with Jesus when he comes back. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Anthony. I'll give you a break there. There's a couple of questions for you. Give you a break to uh, have a sip of uh, water. And uh, <laughs> wow, that's... Uh, a lot there in this uh, paper. Again, we have it on our theological conference, The Gospel and the Second Adam, you've been listening to if you just came in. And I'll put the link to the paper if you'd like to save it. You can download it. As you can see, it's a PDF form. And uh, also, I'd like to show you our main homepage, focusonthekingdom.org. Just talk to you a little bit about what you can find here if you click articles and you can see many by sections the gospel of the kingdom and you keep scrolling down you'll see god as a subject so all articles related to god to jesus life after death and prophecy the so-called rapture and others here so if you just scroll down on the articles as you can see, many, many free. And also in under books, you have Anthony's One God, the Father translation commentary. You can purchase through Amazon if you click on the title, Amazing Names and Claims. And some of these books, as you can see, have been translated kindly by some and others. And again, you can scroll down the coming kingdom of the Messiah and many other books from Antony, some of which you can read for free as PDFs on the website as well. Okay, so a few questions here for you, Antony. Okay. If you don't mind. No, no. Of course so not. let's go to Kingdom of God Ministry. Thank you, Anthony, for your faithful kingdom service. How do you see the difference between Adam's reign before sin compared to Messiah's and ours over animals and planet and new and now over nations too? Well, my concept is that Jesus chose the term kingdom of God because he could see that's where Adam had gone wrong. God charged Adam with taking charge of the earth. God said, I'm going to make man in my image, a reflection of me. He's going to be, so to speak, in quotes, God, representing God, Adam was. And he's supposed to take charge of the world that God had given him. So he fails. Jesus comes along and says, let's reverse that. I'm going to teach you how to get ready to represent God and to rule the world with Jesus in the future kingdom. That's the concept behind what I'm trying to do. All right. Um, Yahweh Kingdom Ministry. Yes. Uh, who are the little flock of Luke 12, 32? JW say yes. it is the 144,000. Yes. Therefore, they do not allow their members to partake in commemoration of Jesus Christ's death. Yes. Well, that's an invention of theirs. They've got this idea that there's a special group of 144,000 the only Christians who are allowed to take the Lord's Supper. That is a terribly false doctrine. The crowd or the, the, the little flock there, of course, means all true believers. Doesn't matter what nationality, the whole point of the New Testament, you can be of any race, nationality at all, and you are part of the Galatians 616, the Israel of God. Now, let me add, this doesn't mean that God is finished with national Israel. There's still a future for a remnant of 
ethnic Jewish people, we'd call them, when they repent, they're going to have to be woken up and there'll be a lot of trouble in Israel, as Tracy was pointing out, which will awaken the now sleeping, figuratively sleeping Jewish people who have not accepted Messiah. There's still a hope for them. But for the moment, Galatians 6.16 6, speaks of the Israel of God, the international group. So the little flock addressed there in 1232 would be all true believers of any nationality from which they might come. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see a couple more. Mm. Uh, from Matt Sacra. Yeah. How do you how do we reconcile yeah. Isaiah 2 4 uh, not learning war anymore yeah. with Revelation 20 verse 8? Gog and Magog gathering for battle, that is for war, to attack the saints. Yeah, well, the first point, of course, in Isaiah 2 4. This is during that millennial kingdom, the first thousand years of the rule of the kingdom of God on earth. The nations are going to learn not to kill each other. Nationalism, patriotism is admirable at one level and really unsuitable at another because Christians shouldn't be killing each other. Once you join the army, the military, this is a difficult concept, you wind up killing other Christians. I don't recommend that. So the whole world is not going to learn war anymore. They're going to learn, let's not use weapons to kill anybody ever. They'll be learning that. Now, after the, the uh, millennium is through, of course, the devil will be released again. And he's going to have the power to deceive some people. So some of them haven't learned the lesson. And so you're going to find war coming again. Gog and Magog have not learned those lessons properly in the millennial kingdom. And so they're still bent on using weapons. That's an interesting question. I would say that the vast majority of people will become conscientious objectors under the instruction of Jesus. Put that gun down. Don't imagine ever killing another human being. Some of them are not going to abide by that, especially when the devil is released from the prison in which he is uh, consigned under the earth at the second coming. This is classical premillennialism. I hope I answered the point. Yeah, it's an interesting question, Anthony, because yeah. uh, the prophecy says nations will not battle against each other. No. But what happens uh, in Revelation 20 is that they actually get together to battle Christians. At the end of it. <laughs> so... Yes. Yeah. So obviously we're not the nations. We are ruling the nations. So they'll come up against us. So it's interesting. Yes. Well, the, the devil is going to have the power to deceive for a short time after the millennium. We know that he's bound so he cannot deceive the nation during the thousand years. But the moment he's released again, people are going to unlearn those lessons. That's the only way I can explain it. They still have free will. Some of them then particularly from Gog and Magog, turn out to be enemies of the truth. So the learning process is going to go have, have to go on until finally everybody gets the point. Do not kill anybody ever. That's going to take some work. Uh, yep. Uh, question here. Uh, please explain uh, oh, yeah. Luke 17, 21. Yeah. Uh, Jesus says, nor will people say, look, the kingdom is here or it is there for behold yes. the kingdom of god is in your midst yes i'm glad that somebody mentioned that i think that's certainly not as bad a translation as the king james the king james has the kingdom of god is in your heart is within you that's absolutely false jesus never said the kingdom of god is in your heart rather He's saying the kingdom of God, when it comes, will not be localized. They won't say, let's rush off here and find it in the wilderness. Let's rush off there and find it somewhere else. No, no, because the kingdom of God will be like lightning shining from the east to the west, totally visible and totally uh, accessible in the sense you don't have to go hunting for it in the, in the desert. So that's the correct translation. I think Richard, Professor Richard Hyers 
helped us with that particularly, and he specialized in that verse. So the kingdom of God will be like lightning coming from east to west, totally universal, certainly not just in your heart, but rather a totally visible, universally visible like lightning. That's what the kingdom of God will be like when it finally arrives. All right. Thank you, Anthony, for your presentation, your paper. So that does it for this Saturday, long Saturday of presentations. And um, once again, uh, on our homepage, focusonthekingdom.org, you can go to live stream. And if you'd like to follow Anthony, he's usually sermonizing, teaching on Sunday mornings around 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you'd like to tune in and listen to us, to Anthony, give his commentary and others here at Restoration Fellowship, <clears throat> please join us uh, Sunday mornings if you're looking for fellowship, of course, online fellowship. And uh, tomorrow, though, uh, still, I guess, officially the conference and Traditionally, we finish with a guest speaker. And the uh, last few years, we've had Pastor Dennis Baldwin. So we finish uh, officially the conference tomorrow. We start at 10 a.m. again, Eastern Standard Time or New York Time. And uh, we begin with a couple of faith stories. So in case you're new to this, uh, they're always a highlight because faith stories or testimonies uh, foster friendships and strengthen fellowships. So if someone is bold to speak out, it encourages others, we hope, around the world to also speak and share their stories. So tomorrow we start at 10 with a couple of faith stories. So for now, we will close with prayer. And once again, uh, thanks to all presenters and please uh, prayers for them. Some of them going through health issues, as I've said, keep them in your prayers. Father, we thank you for this time, the technology, the ability to do this in safety, in real luxury compared to the rest of this fallen world. We pray for those less fortunate than us. We pray for the wars and the conflicts, especially always in that Middle East part, Ukraine, Russia, and other places. We first pray for the church, our family of believers, brothers and sisters. We pray for our enemies, those who want to cause us harm, who want to see us fail in our ministries. But we pray for them nonetheless. We pray for the heads of state, the governments, the politicians, those in power and authority to leave us alone and in peace so we can continue doing this work of preaching the gospel about the kingdom of God and the things regarding your son, Father, the Messiah, Jesus. And we also pray to Jesus. We can talk to Jesus. He's at your right hand, Father. And Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice, this uh, great hope and faith we have, and faith and hope that is not seen or that can be seen is no hope at all. So for the moment, we do not see it. We do not see the kingdom, but that is the hope because that's the definition of hope and faith, something that is not yet seen. So, Father, uh, keep us safe. Once again, thanks for all our viewers. Please bless them. And uh, in the name of the Messiah Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless everyone until we meet again.